running fans, jumping fans, throwing fans, all around athletics fans. Welcome to Talking Innovals. I am Alex Cuesta. My partner in crime over there is Dave Hyatt. What's going on, brother? Not much. I mean, here in New Jersey, it was a crazy weekend for high school athletics. We had meet the champs, and it was it actually ended up being a great week, despite the NJSIA trying to make it a horrible meet. But I, I digress with that. And then we we had nationals, and there were so many wonderful performances from people here from Jersey and and throughout the whole country. What a weekend! And and that doesn't even talk about Diamond League, which was another awesome race. We know Hyatt says it every single week. It was an incredible week in track and field. And it seems like since world, since worlds in Oregon, week after week, after week, after week, after week, we've had nonstop action. We have Robert Griffin, the third going at Michael Johnson. We have Emmanuel Acho getting involved. Of I course, love it. Steve Magnus always giving his little tidbits, jumping in there. It has been, it's just getting fun. This is the time where the iron's hot. Now, before we get going with the fun stuff, we're recording today, Monday, the 19th, 2023. If you like what you hear, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five stars, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Find us on the socials. Go search The Alex Cuesta Show. So quickly, last week's show, we had a fun show, Hyatt. We had Mike Walker, assistant coach of men's and women's cross country and track and field at College of New Jersey. Um, he has a fun perspective from coaching at a D3 school, also being a high school coach. It was just a really good show. Um, it was lots of fun. We talked to Mike about Absolutely. a bunch of different stuff, and it was great. So go give that a listen. And I want to jump into some PRs real quick. We'll talk about some of the mock stuff. We'll get through that pretty quickly. We have a lot to talk about, and we have a fantastic guest. So, Dave, let's put it into overdrive real quick. Um, all right, let's do it. All right, we so got, first, um, go ahead, hi. From what I know, and certainly you can fact check us, we have uh, our buddy from South Brunswick, his athlete, uh, Demaris Potts. I think I believe he's the first ever athlete to get top three in all three jumping events. He the wins the – yeah, I'm sorry, at the media champs. He wins high jump at, at 6'10". Long jump, he gets a second at like 23'3", and then he gets a third in, in, in the triple at like 46 feet. Just an amazing feat. And then he goes on to nationals, and he wins nationals with a high jump of 6'9". You know, we have Tom Driven North winning the 4x4 at nationals in 314. It's just it's just absolutely unreal. We have Avery Keith from Westfield running 906 for the full two mile as a junior converts to about 903 for the 32 to break the Westfield school record. Just an amazing weekend. And I, I'm sure that you can add to that now. Yeah. We had Al Mubarak out of Ragba. He won the meter champs in the long jump. He had a great jump. He beat the Marius bots, but that was a, you know, really close matchup. And then we have some kids from ocean. We have Mark Vigiano running a 151. Alexander Sotokov taking second to the, the highest ranked national 400 meter hurdle runner ran a 51 flat. And then we have a sophomore, Olivia Palutis, competing in nationals, running a 215 and a huge PR from Ocean. We just had so much going around. And I want to jump in lastly from Train Academy in Baltimore. Our good friend, Megan Blue, Coach Blue over there, um, had a bunch of PBs. Uh, Ayesha DeVries um, improved from 4'8 to 5 uh, to five foot in the high jump. Uh, Kayla DeVries, um, Ran 13.4 in the 100 and 27.35 in the two. Michael Johnson has a birthday on Wednesday. Happy birthday. He's going to be 17. He ran a 13.31 in the 100. Jade Briston, 14. 13.72 in the 100. Aaliyah Solomon, 15. She's age 15. 13.63 in the 100. Alex Lee, 11.18 in the 100. Daniel, I'm going to butcher your last name. Ungun Modede ran a 23.41 200. Jervisi. So Kawanda ran a 501 in the 5 1500. And one of the most impressive things, Hyatt, they have a three year old, Michael Walker, ran a 24.28 in the 100 and a 4.55 in the 300 at three years old. That's pretty good running that fast in some huggies. That is that. fantastic. Uh, yeah. I got one more too. I Go got uh, from, from my town here, Point Borough. Blake Savinsky yes. drops a huge PR at nationals, gets sixth place in a 149. It's just crazy that 149 is sixth place in, in any high school meet. But nowadays, that's just how it is. That is how it is. So let's Congrats, jump Blake. into this week's show. We have a fantastic guest. Now, it's going to seem like we set it up this way, but I swear we didn't. We had him booked before his men went crazy at NCAA Nationals. We have Ricardo Santos. He's a distance, distance assistant coach over at Stanford University. What's going on, coach? Hey, how's it going? I'm good. I'm glad, to have, glad you guys have me on. 
Yeah, it's going real well. And I, I was just saying a Hyatt. It's been, you know, years since I've actually seen you. I saw you in a, a good amount of times while I was over helping out at Marist. Uh, you were still over at Iona at the time. And to say that you've had success everywhere you've gone is kind of an understatement. Um, as I aforementioned, you have just had the 5K and 10K national champion in Kai Robinson, and then Charlie Hicks taking second in the 10K, coming off of his cross-country championship earlier this year. Uh, you have had such a great year, um, such a great few years over at Stanford since coming over. Uh, I just want to quickly ask, what is what was this weekend like? Um, was there confidence for them being able to do this the, always there? Yeah, I mean, and we can't forget that uh, Charles Hicks uh, finished sixth in the 5K as well, yep. and and his three points catapulted the team to uh, uh, to third place there. So that was, that was awesome. Obviously, Yudoti, uh, um I'm going to butcher his last name, and I shouldn't uh, under under uh, <laughs> blank in there. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, he you know finished sixth in the hundred and came back in in the two and won the two hundred. So he was awesome as well. Uh, and we had a couple of other guys there too, um, that in uh, Garrett Brown in the pole vault and um, and um, um, John Kruger in the long jump. Uh, they didn't score, but they competed well. So yeah, but getting back to the question, um, yeah, and, and Kai and Charles ran great. Um, I thought that we had a shot uh, of going one two in, in the ten. Obviously, he had some really good guys in the ten. I thought the ten was was fairly deep this year, um, and obviously Dylan Jacobs being the uh, you know um, the defending champion. You know you don't want to ever count out the defending champion. Uh, but I also knew that you know I, I I'll put. Uh, Car, um, Kai and Charles's kick up against really anyone in that 10k I, re I really would um and I thought that if they just were smart and they just conserved their energy and were there with uh with three laps you know 800 to go I, I had all faith in them to to kind of get that job done um and then the 5k was just the icing on the cake um you know they both told me that they felt good on on Thursday after their after their run um getting ready for Friday uh, that their legs didn't feel too beat up and that's when I kind of thought okay yeah this is this is a possibility that that one of them can can pull out the five and and uh um, you know, to be honest, uh, as well as he did run and, and got back into it in, in the five, uh, Char as Charles did, uh, I do think he kind of might have left a few a few more places out there when he missed that break uh, at a mile to go when Nico Young yeah. went and he was kind of stuck in the back. And and uh, the one thing I told him that he didn't couldn't do uh, and, and he did in that race, but it was great that he kind of kept kept on charging. He was leading that chase pack, um, getting back up to up to that lead pack and, and he caught that that lead pack just as Kai got got to the front with 400 go and started kicking so he had to kind of go again but uh he did a great job picking off picking off three guys in that, in that last lap and and getting a huge three points to put us in third place so yeah yeah no it was it was an awesome weekend uh you know it, it was great so so what was it like looking on do I don't know if you use Twitter much but what was it like looking on Twitter and Instagram and after the 10k yeah we're focused on guys Here's Coach Ricardo Santos yelling, yeah, go! And then same thing, 5K. It's like, and he's back. Was that kind of surreal? Like your athletes are getting the spotlight, but then here you are kind of getting recognition as well for being so hyped and pumped for your guys. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just I'm just happy for them, um, you know, and, and that's just the emotion coming out. And, and I, I think, too, a part of that is, is you know, we, we've had a lot of frustrations this year, too. I mean, and you look at it and someone may say you just coached three individual national champions through the full full year, through a full academic year. You know, what frustrations do you have? But you know the, we, we've had a lot of them you know the, the obviously the team not running as well as we wanted to at ncaa's and and even though we got a trophy and and that was our secondary goal and still getting a trophy we feel like you know a lot of things didn't go our way and and even and then look at indoors you know we we had a we had guys there i mean kai was there and he only finished seventh in in the in the 5k now i say only seventh but that's it's still in a, in a really deep field and and charles didn't even score in the 5k uh and kai that came back and didn't even score in the 3k so there was frustrations there throughout the year and i i feel like part of that was just really happy genuinely happy for charles and, and kai and just everyone else on the team that that really helped those guys to get to that level um but also to just kind of letting out those frustrations of just like, you know, hey, we went from cross country that 
Charles won and we celebrated that, but the team didn't didn't run as well as we wanted to, to then the frustrations of indoor to now, okay, we we ended it on this note of going one, two, and then, you know, one again and and six and 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 you know, finishing third as a team when really no one uh, thought that we had a shot of of getting a trophy there uh, as a team. So uh, a lot of that was kind of the combination of those two things. I love it. It's great. Yeah, show that fantastic. Show, show that love and that emotion for your athletes. I think it's fantastic. And yeah. you know, in the great programs, they have standards, right? And uh, you know, I know you guys at Stanford. You think of yourselves as a great program, and you have standards. You're not. You're never happy. Yeah, you have you know, repeat national champion, high placing guys, but then you do, you look at the team aspect and it's like, what else could we have done here, here and here to get us into first. Now I want to jump into you yourself coach, because one of the main segments we do here is we like to talk about our guests and what got them started in running and, uh, you know, talk, have you give you a chance to talk about your own career because People might see you now coaching. Uh, you're you were a pretty damn good runner yourself. Pretty decorated, um, you know, dominating the Mac for the time that you were at Iona. But I want to jump all the way back. When did you first get the spark of you know this is it? I'm going to be a runner. This is what I want to do. When was that moment of you like turning it around and saying I just want to run and I want to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's got to go back to when I was in the sixth grade. Um, I never really liked running, to be honest. Uh, I wanted to play hockey. I wanted to be a goalie. But I'm five, stretching it, I'm probably about 5'8", five, maybe 5'7". Five, uh, and that ain't going to get it done in in, in the NHL. Um, <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to be a goalie. Uh, and then my second love was actually volleyball. And I'm, again, too short to play volleyball. So uh, really, it was my brother that got me into running. My brother was very talented runner, just had a lot of injuries uh, and just kind of didn't pan out there for him. Um, but yeah, he got me into running. I started running really, I ran first time in the fourth grade, hated it. Um, and then I didn't run in the fifth grade and then I kind of started running again in the sixth grade. And, and I kind of, I won, I won our, our first, I think it was called the, the divisionals or something like that. Um, so I won that race and, you know, as we had three rounds in, in, in elementary school, divisionals, regionals, and then metros, which was metropolitan Toronto championships, which I don't know if I mentioned, I grew up in Toronto. So, uh, that's where the hockey background comes from. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, I kind of got the bug there at sixth grade cause I made it all the way to the Metro finals. And my big goal there was to finish top 10. Cause if you finish top 10 there, they let you announce your own name, uh, after the race in your place. So I was like, Oh, I want to do that. Yeah. So, cool. um, yeah. So that's when I kind of got the bug. And, and from there, it was, I still played some other sports, but eventually, slowly but surely gave them all up. And by the time I got to high school, I just kind of knew, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to run. I want to try to see as uh, how good I can be. Um, you know, for myself and, and my team um, and, and see how far I can go in the sport. So you, is, go ahead. Is growing up in, Canada is it like is the whole cross country track scene different there than it would be here in the United States on a high school level? Like, yeah, it, it is. It's uh, it's a lot more individualized than it is team based. Um, you know, and that's one of the f one of the things that um, I sh I didn't I struggled with a little bit um, when I first got to Iona was really like the team aspect of it because I was just so used to individual it, it in in Canada and and a lot of times and even in other countries in Europe. It's the individual first and then then the team. Now, it could be different like now, um, you know, but, um, you know, but when I was growing up, it was really kind of the individual, you know, it was always individual kind of uh, performance first. And then, oh, if your team won, that's great. Or if your team got a medal at, at the Ontario Championships, oh, that's great. You know, but it was it was kind of more individual based. So that was one of the things that I did kind of have to, you know, rewire my brain to is just like that. OK, cross country here in the U.S., it's team first. It's it's yeah. the team and then the individual, uh, which is a great thing. You know, I think it, it really it's, it, I think it keeps people in the sport longer um, and it also helps people to build camaraderie and, and to then kind of work with each other to see uh, how good that they can actually be. Certainly. So quick question. Have you suggested to the NCAA to let the podium winners announce their own name at the championship? <laughs> I think that would be an awesome twist. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I haven't, but you know, I, I really never thought of it. Um, I think that'd yeah, be great. I, I think that would, I think that would be really cool. I think it really, be, I, I think you'd get a lot of uh, some really 
cool introductions or yeah. you know, uh, lead in lead ins to their to yeah. saying their name. I think that all their you, social handles and then all that. Right, stuff. exactly. Yeah, you know, you get you get a lot of different things there. So, uh, but yeah, no, that uh, maybe maybe next time I see uh, some of the NCAA committee members, I'll I'll throw that out to them. It would so, be like Monday Night Football where they announce their name yeah, they like on the bottom. Like there you go. <laughs> exactly, From this yeah. high school. So I have a question. Um <laughs> growing, you know, you, you went to high school in Toronto. Was there any pressure to go to college there, or did you kind of know that you wanted to to come to the States to go to college? Yeah, no, there was no pressure to go to college there. Um, you know, I, I always knew that that I wanted to to come to the U.S. Um, you know, that was always my main goal and trying trying to get here because I, you know, you know, growing up that that's the NCAA for this age category is really the best talent in the world. Um, so that's that's something that I, I really uh, wanted to do and and yes, aspired to do. And luckily, I had the opportunity to to fulfill that. So what are some of your favorite memories? Give us a walk down memory lane going through, you know, beginning of your career, like basically start us at sixth grade, take us through like middle school, high school. Um, I don't know exactly the Canadian structure for schools, so I don't know if you guys do like just primary all the way up to secondary. But um, uh, talk talk about some of your favorite memories and then, you know, your memories going into Iona and things like that. Give us some fun stories that maybe friends don't want you to tell. (laughs) um no yeah so like in in middle school or elementary school i should say because it was i went to you know k to up through eight in in one school like yeah so um yeah started really running in the sixth grade uh progressed from there um i played all, all sorts of sports so you know i I played baseball and played basketball even and volleyball and all, all that throughout uh elementary school um but yeah one of my you know, um, biggest things running wise was, uh, I was really happy with was, or one of my biggest memories I improved every year. And it's funny because I was like in sixth grade, I finished ninth at the Metro finals, which is like the Toronto championships, all of metropolitan Toronto. And then in the seventh grade, I was sixth. And then in the eighth grade, I was third. So it's kind of like every year I was getting, you know, three places ahead. So, uh, luckily, you know, I didn't, you know, I went off to high school after that. Cause I guess the next one would be zero. And I don't know how good zero is uh, <laughs> in a result. So, um, but yeah, so then I, I moved on to, to high school and, um, you know, I actually went to two different high schools. I went to uh, uh, Bishop Morocco Thomas Merton in in Toronto um, for two years, and then I went to Michael Power St. Joseph's, which is in Etobicoke, but technically metropolitan Toronto. And um, you know, one of my greatest memories from my first high school was winning the Ontario Championships. I, I won uh, the Office of Championships as a second year midget since I have uh, since I'm. A, it's different now, but back then when I was in school, uh, because they had the five years of, of high school in, in Ontario, um, if you were born after September 1st, you had you stayed in the lower category, which was called midget. I think they changed the name now. Uh, you stayed there for two years. So I have a really late birthday. I don't, uh, my birthday is not till December. So I was what they call a double midget. So a lot of times, most people back then, you would go one year midget, two years junior, two years senior. But if you were a double midget, you go two years midget, two years junior, one year senior. So, um, but yeah, so then I moved on to my other high school, Michael Power St. Joseph's, mainly because my track club coach, um, Eddie Raposo from um, Toronto Olympic Club, which was the club I was with, uh, he coached there. So I, I moved to that club and I, I then moved to uh, to that other school to to be with him so he can coach me in both, like, in both club and high school. And yeah, I finished second at Offsa, Offsa Cross Country there a couple times, one time as a second year junior and the, the other time as a senior. Um, but I think probably the most um, memorable thing about high school was was making the Canadian junior team um, that that last year there, and I got to represent Canada at the um, World uh, Cross Country Championships uh, back in 1995 in Durham, England, and that was a great trip. Nice. You know, I made a lot of friends there, um, not just on the junior team but senior team too, uh, and it was just a great experience. Um, you know, it was it was the first time I got I got thrown into a world champ world race with all, all that talent. And you know, when I say it, it was eye opening, it was eye opening because uh, I remember a K into the race, and I looked at the clock, and I believe I was two fifty at the K, and I looked back, and there was about four people behind me. And I was, I, it was 250 for the first K and it was the last 400 that was starting to go uphill. And I was just felt like I was like 
rolling already. And I was looked back and there's literally like four or five people behind me. And I was like, Oh, I got to get going. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I finished in the hundreds. It's all right. Uh, hey. it, it was, it was eye opening, but it was, it was also a great experience. You know, it was one of those things where I I've always cherished it. Um, and it really helped me to then kind of propel into the, um, into college, um, on the track. I never, high school was a little disappointing on, Track wise, I ran some decent PRs. You know, I ran three fifty nine for fifteen hundred and like eight thirty five for three k. You know, nothing great to write home about. Uh, ran like fifteen flat for five k. Um, but yeah, but then going on to college, and and I think you know the biggest thing, uh, my biggest memory in college was was you know obviously finishing twenty first at NCAA's. Um, that day was bittersweet because we didn't run that well as a team, and and I have. M- better team memories of the year before when I didn't run that well as, as a individual, um, when we finished 13th in, in 1997 and 98, I was, I was an all American. I finished 21st there. Um, but yeah, I mean, those, those were kind of some of the highlights and, you know, obviously for only people on the Northeast would know the IC four A's, you know, I was, oh, yeah. well, I won the IC four A's three times on the track and, and that was a, a really, you know, I felt a, a really good accomplishment. Um, I was really excited about that because, you know, um, IC four A's for, again, for some people that don't know the IC four A's is older than the NCAA and we I both won- know here. Yeah. Yeah. At, at one point it served as a national championship meet. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so it was one of those things where I, I cherished that. And, and obviously the, the main thing, the biggest thing was the camaraderie with a lot of, a lot of my teammates and, and, and kind of just hanging out with them and all of the, uh, things that we, we got into. I know coach McBurn, uh, I, I know he lost a lot of hair, uh, <laughs> with our, with, when I was there, he's um, a legend. McBurn. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, we, we put him through a lot. <laughs> Uh, you know, but he was great and, and he, you know, he helped me and, and I have uh, nothing but respect for him. Uh, he's still a great friend of mine to, to this day. And I, and, uh, you know, he, he's, um, you know, if, if it were, really, if it wasn't for Mick Byrne, I, I probably wouldn't be a coach. Um, and, and that that's the honest truth, you know, so it's, it's one of those things where he, he helped me along in my running career. Uh, and then when that was done, he, he helped me to, to become a coach when I decided I wanted to be a coach. First thing he said is like, are you sure? Um, <laughs> and, uh, he's like, do you know what that entails? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, no, I mean, he, he, you know, he's, he's helped me a lot through the, through the process and, and helped me early on, uh, and just kind of, you know, been there for me along with, well, along with some other, other coaches too, that I have a lot of respect for. So, yeah, I mean here, you know, Northeast, you know, you don't really think of Iona as this big school, but in terms of distance running and cross country, it is an elite program. I mean, Mick did a, a great job and then he passed the, the torch on to you. But I mean, just kind of explain, like, how does a school that size, that small, just churn out so many amazing runners and so many wonderful teams where you're top five in the NCAA is almost every single year? Like, how does that come about? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that uh, just comes down to the down to being a close knit family. Uh, one of the great one of the things that about Iona that I really loved, especially when I visited and and when I worked there, was that it it didn't feel like uh, obviously it's not a small a big school, but it, it it really felt like a family. It really felt like everyone was pushing for each other because we were such a small school because we were that underdog that everyone was like, hey if we're going to get this done, we need to stick together. And it's just not within like cross country track and field. It was within all sports. It was within all departments because, you know, um, you know, admissions really w- was there to kind of help us. And, and, and with, with, uh, when we had international athletes come and the housing, when, when we had international athletes come or when we had, uh, people that we wanted to, you know, maybe room together or something like that. Um, you know, so we had all of those departments that really helped, um, each other out, uh, because yeah, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of schools are, are run like a business. Um, and when I was at Iona as a student athlete and as a coach, I never, I didn't have that feeling. Uh, it felt like more as a family, like, Hey, we have each other's back and that's how we really were able to get it done. And that's, you know, that, that's, um, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I ended up going to Iona in the first place as, as a student athlete. I mean, you, you, you mentioned something, you know, huge there. They were really one of the first schools, at least on, on the East coast to get those, that international talent, you know, like, You know, Coach Byrne did a great job of getting so like of not just keeping in this little box of, of Northeast of, of expanding and 
getting athletes from all over the world. So that had to be cool to have all these teammates, guys from, from all different cultures and all different parts of, of the, the world. Like that, that had to really broaden you, not just as an athlete, but as a person too. Oh, no, for sure. I mean, one of my other best friends was uh, is an Irish guy. Uh, he lives in Ireland, but we talk every now and then, Vinnie Mulvey. He was uh, the best man at both of my weddings. So, um, you know, but yeah, it was, we had, we had people from, obviously I was an international athlete coming from Canada, but you know, we had guys from Ireland, from England. Um, you know, when I was there, um, I mean, since I was there, when I was a coach, we've had Germany, Norway, um, Kenya, um, you know, uh, and I'm blanking on some other ones, but you know, we've had, we've had people from all over the world, you know, Australia. So it's, it's been, it's been great because you get to see, um, how other cultures are and you get to enrich yourself in, in other cultures. Um, and just really, and you know, if you want to go on a holiday and you go to Europe and you want to go to Ireland, you have a place to stay. Yeah, cool. That's <laughs> you know, you have cool. a place to stay. You have a tour guide. You have all of those things. So it, it's great. Um, you know, so it, it's one of those things where I really cherish that that time and that experience. Um, and I do think, like, yeah, like when I was coaching Iona, we had a lot of our um, um, domestic ath- athletes, uh, student athletes. They went away on trips with with their um, with their teammates, and 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 it's the other way as well. You know, we had a lot of international athletes that would go home with our american athletes um to thanksgiving to christmas and we're especially thanksgiving they didn't realize what thanksgiving right. was and they were in, in you know they were thrown into this huge festival that they didn't realize the the significance of what it meant until they went there and, and lived it with with those families so yeah it kind of it goes both ways for uh for american and the international student athletes right. That, and training that, at Van Curler Park is, I mean, you can't get better yeah. than that every day. That course will, will get you ready for anything. Yeah, for sure. So, well, for sure. So, Coach, did you feel that, you know, coming from Canada where it was more of like an individualistic style where you kind of had to have that killer instinct, right? If you were competing in Canada, you were very focused on your individual accomplishments. <laughs> did you feel like bringing that over to America helped you as a coach where you were kind of, you know, you – figure it out kind of the team aspect as a student athlete at Iona, right? But did you feel that still having that individual aspect to yourself helped you as an athlete and as a coach to kind of, you know, make some of these individuals that maybe are a little too team oriented and be like, Hey, get after it. Like, mm-hmm. put, you know, put, put, you know, just cause you're there, your teammate doesn't mean you can't put the pedal down sometime. Like, do you feel like that's helped you? In a way, you uh, blending both the Canadian and kind of the American styles of uh, cross country and track. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you want to you want to have a mix of that. You want to have that mentality of you know, I, you know, you want to have like that killer mentality in the sense of like, hey, I want to get into this race and I want to win. I want to be the the top dog. Uh, but at the same time, like you know, you want to make sure that you know, you're, you're helping out your teammates in practice. You're helping out to, you're getting them ready for the race. And when you do that and they see that you're, you know, getting after it and you're up there in the race and they're like, Hey, I was able to train with him. I was able to be with him in workouts. I can be up there too. So let me get into my head. Let me have that killer instinct too. And develop that killer instinct of like, Hey, I can be up there and we can have now, we can have two guys up there. And then that just kind of goes to the third guy. Hey, I can be up there too. So yeah, there is that, that team dynamic of, you know, Hey, you know, everyone's got their spot on the team or, or their kind of role on the team. But there's also that you want to make sure you want to have a little bit of that individualism as well of like, so that people can express themselves as well. It's not just, it's not just racing to be the top dog, but it's also like being an individual and expressing yourself as an individual so you can be comfortable in your own skin yeah. that's going to really help that team as well. So it's, it's, it's not just a physical piece, but it's also that mental piece as well. So when it comes to practice, um, how are you as a practice coach when it comes to like hitting times and things like that? Like, I know you're obviously pretty strict, but I mean, there's kind of, I feel like a blend and dynamic of how much do you want the team aspect to be when you're kind of doing a hard workout Mm -hmm. and how much do you want the individuals to kind of beat up on each other a little bit and push each other more. And yeah, if he's not hanging with you, just go like type of deal. Like where is that fine line with you again, balancing that individualism with the let's build each other up type of deal. Like where, where do you kind of land on that? 
Yeah, I'm, uh, it depends on the time of the season. Uh, if we are in uh, building for the season in, in base mode, if it's if we're just getting to campus um, and uh, we're doing like tempos and we're doing those longer workouts, then it's like, all right, we need to make sure we're sticking together. This is a workout where we're where we're running together. Yep. Uh, we're not overextending ourselves. It's early in the season. So a lot of those workouts early on are more designed to, okay, let's stick together. Let's help each other out through this. Let's get a good solid workout in. Let's get some volume in. It's it's not about cranking it out right now. It's not about that intensity. That'll come later on. And as we get through the season, then it's kind of like time. Okay. Now it's time to really start turning the screws where it's like, you know, if I take, for example, this last year, you know, once we get to probably after mid October, after nutty comb, you know, Charles Hicks started turning the screws. Like you saw a difference in Charles and I let him go. It's just like, okay, this is what we got to do. You're going after a national title. Same thing with like, like Cole Sprout and, and Kai Robinson would be with him sometimes, but sometimes you would see they would have to back off. And then I'd have to hold uh, back some of the other guys too, that aren't ready for that. Or, or we split them up into a uh, split them up into two different groups. That's not um, easy to do. <laughs> to hold it's back. not easy to it's do. It's not easy to hold back some high level guys no. like that when they, or no. believe they could be where Charlie is. Yeah, exactly. And and sometimes you 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 know you you have to have those conversations with with uh, your athletes and saying, hey, you know, this is why you're not there right now, or this yeah. is why I'm having you run these times because it's going to be more beneficial to you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't race with him. It doesn't necessarily mean where you're not going to be able to race hard or race well. It's just like you got it. That's when you need to make sure you stay within your skin and stay within yourself yeah. so that you can compete well. Um, yeah. And, and so like, so in essence, yeah, you want to, you want to um, kind of balance those two things out. Um, but for the, majority of the time we do do a lot of stuff together we i do try to keep them together for the majority of the workout and then you know as we get into the more intense workouts of the season it's then it's like okay towards the end of the workout it's like all right you guys can start turning the screws you guys you guys stay where you're at right now and and i'll kind of look at that as we're going along through the workout and obviously so, the results speak for themselves, right? Yeah. They see what you're doing with these guys. So I guess there's that trust built, obviously trust through success. Mm -hmm. They've seen what you've done at every single place you've gone. So it's like frustrating, but let's listen to coach. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to get back into a, a little bit about you. So you go to college at, at Iona and then you become, and then you, you go to Harvard for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you come back to Iona as an assistant under coach Byrne. Yeah. Uh, no, coach no. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So basically, um, so I was, uh, after I graduated from Iona, I went to Columbia for grad school. I did that for a year. After grad school, I was teaching in the Bronx for uh, at a um, Catholic high school called All Hollows High School. So I did that for four years. And during those four years, I was a volunteer coach at Iona. Okay. So during uh, during that last year where I was teaching, uh, I was a guidance counselor and I was teaching. I um, got a little bit more involved with volunteering. I started going to more to a few more meets because uh, before that it was more just kind of like helping Mick drive, have, be an extra driver to go to practice or to go to a meet or something like that uh, whenever I could. But then, you know, that last year I started to kind of be a little bit more involved, a little bit more involved in practice. I kind of also knew that my running was kind of <laughs> going off to the side a little bit more. I wasn't, you know, <laughs> was kind of getting to that point now where, and then I was just just kind of like I was like, all right, this is interesting. Let me let me get a little bit more of a sense of this. So I kind of started looking at it more, started getting more involved, and that's when I decided I was like, I think I really want to do this. So um, that's when I got I got I was lucky to get the uh, position at Harvard as an assistant coach. Uh, so I was there for three years. That was 05 to 08. Uh, and then when Mick left for Wisconsin in, in the summer of 08, I went back to Iona as the head coach. So um, yeah, and then so I was there from 08 uh august of 08 to march of 18 and then i went to the baa uh worked with their professional group from march of 18 to to basically august of 19 really missed working with you know the college kids and and that team aspect and obviously when a position like stanford's opens up uh, and you have that have that chance you don't you don't pass that up um yeah. so um yeah made made the move out west at that point and been here ever since so I want to ask you, because earlier we were talking about, you know, the difference between team and the individual concept. When you went to 
coach pros in, in Boston. Does that whole team asset kind of just go out the window? And then it's a really, you're now more focusing on the, on the individual aspect. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it goes completely out the window. Cause we, we did have a, um, you know, we had a couple of guys there and we had uh, about five or six women. Uh, we were a little bit more w- woman heavy there at, at the BAA and, and they had won the club Nats nationals, uh, I think two years in a row before, before I got there. And I think we were second that year. I, I can't remember now, but, um, uh, but yeah, no, but it does shift a little bit more to the individual because obviously it's their livelihood now. Like yeah. they have to make ends meet and yeah, they have their contract, but not, you know, um, Boston's expensive. Yeah. Uh, so there's some countries out there where there's groups at and they're expensive, but I do feel like there is a, a, a camaraderie. There's still that team aspect. And I think that's really good in the professional ranks to still have that because they can, you know, when someone's hurt or someone's having a tough time, you have your teammates that that you can lean on. But there is a little bit more of that individualism because you just need it because you have to survive in this sport. And this sport is it's hard um, to make it as a professional athlete. So, yeah, so you there is a little bit more of that individual emphasis. But um, for the most part, when when someone's part of a team or if there's a group like that, uh, then you do get you still get a sense of that team camaraderie. You know, it was interesting because I was over at Maris as an athlete from 07 to uh, 2012, came back and coached a little bit. And, you know, you mentioned your time at Iona, and it just felt like every single year there, when it came to XC Nationals, they kind of had you guys ranked in like 10th, uh, 8th, 13th. And then every, it felt like every year it was like, oh, here's Iona finishing in the top five, Iona finishing in second. And it was like you had a bunch of good things there, and you really – to help turn Iona into even more of a well-known powerhouse to the point where now they still have that ridiculously good tradition and distance. What is it like going from coaching at a smaller school like Iona where, you know, not to knock Iona, but obviously less resources than Stanford has uh, facility quality is obviously different going from a Mac school to a PAC 12 school um, kind of juxtapose the differences between having the coach in the Mac and Iona verse now being an assistant over at a, you know, one of the biggest universities in the country. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, to be honest, um, it is night and day. You do see the difference um, in the budgets. You do see the difference in the facilities. You do see the difference. The biggest difference is in the support staff. You know, we have like at Stanford, we have two trainers that two athletic trainers that are assigned to our sport. We have, two um um pts that work with with our sport wow. uh we have nutritionists that work works with our sport we have our own strength and conditioning coach uh the team doctors all of that stuff we have our own pt clinic right on campus so it's just like we have an athletic training room and we have a pt clinic you know we have all of these resources there um you know the nutrition the you know we have our own athlete dining center so it's I want to couldn't afford to do that. It's just, there's just that money. There's that budget in these power uh, conference schools that allow them to do it and allow them to have, have that, um, I don't want to say edge, but just, you know, have that, those yeah. extra, those resources that a mid-major or, you know, one of those mid-major conferences that, that they don't have, or a school like Iona doesn't have, or a school like, like Marist that, that doesn't have, because you don't have that type of funding. You don't have that money coming in, that revenue. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really night and day. It's, it's, you know, you, you look at it and, and you say, yeah, I'm really blessed to have that, but then I also know the other end of it. So for me, I'm really blessed to to have right. that. Yeah. Uh, I understand the, um, the hardships of some of the other coaches out there and what they have to go through. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's really night and day. And, you know, like you, obviously your story is far yet to be told over at Stanford. Like you've had a ton of success in a short time there. And I think you guys are set up to be really good for a really long time with what you guys are definitely building there. But does it make you kind of appreciate what you were able to accomplish even more at Iona, knowing what you know now about Stanford and looking back going, 
I was competing at nationals against this. Like these are the type of things I was up against and how my, you know, like you said, Iona's a tight knit family. Um, you know, I think a lot of the Mac schools share that because we're smaller, we're more underdogs and that's kind of all of our mentality. But, um, does it kind of make you appreciate what you were able to accomplish over there as a head coach? Oh, no, for sure. It's just like, it's one of those things like I, I have nothing but respect for those smaller schools, those mid-major schools that are able to put people at the NCAA championships, either as an individual or get teams there, you know, have people score and get onto the podium on, on indoor and outdoor track and, 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 you know, have first team all Americans that is, is a great accomplishment um you know i have nothing but respect for those people and i have nothing respect for the others that that are trying that aren't getting there but you know what they are working hard because it's it is uh it's difficult it's tough and and it's it's gotten a lot tougher over the last few years especially with the transfer portal and all those things where people couldn't really transfer really easily now and yeah. and you can be in one of these you know mid-major schools that has all of a sudden gets a diamond in a rough and and you know coach them up and and they they're great for two years and all of a sudden oh i'm gonna go to power conference school now for my next two years or some of that and and you know i, I feel bad for those for those smaller schools that that um you know because it is easier now to for that for kids to kind of leave and go to those those power conferences but yeah i have nothing for, but respect for them you know they do a great job and and looking back at it and it's just like yeah it's it, it, you know it was uh um i don't want to say an incredible feat but it was it was something that was just um that i feel really proud of not just for me but for mick Byrne, who was before me for my assistants that helped me because to do that it it, it you don't do it alone you have to have great assistance around you, you know, and I had really great assistance around me the whole time. I mean, heck, one of my former assistants is now is the head coach now has been the head coach at Iona since since I left. Joe Piente has done a great job in keeping that going. Um, you know, head coaches, I know that they're only as good as their assistants, um, you know, and that's why for me as an assistant coach now, I know my my, my job is to make sure that, you know, Coach Clark um you know that i make his job easier um that that's my that's my job to for to do while, while i'm an assistant coach um and and so but yeah like as as a head coach you you know you owe a lot to your assistant coaches because they they put in a lot of great work um and they help you out a lot and i think that's what's great about you know say cross country per se is you know like you know at, at stanford you have all all these amenities but in cross country, you just need like, you know, sneakers and a, a good coach. Like you, you don't, it's not like other sports where you have to spend all this money. If, if you have a, a great group of, of guys and a coach who's willing and a team who buys in, you can see these smaller schools really make a dent on that national level be, because yeah. it's just, you know, like you, you don't need all those fancy things in, in order to run fast and to put together a good team. Yeah. And, and even, even within our own sport of, of you know the other seasons of track and field like you look at it like you know you need to have you know money to have those other event areas and so yeah. Yeah. it's 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 even more simplistic in cross country than it is for track and field okay. just because of those other event areas and and the budget Absolutely. money that you need to have um you know to support the athletes to you know poles are expensive oh yeah the school doesn't want to buy poles. You can't have a pole vaulter. You know, exactly. implements are expensive. You know, pole vault her, pits pole. are ridiculously expensive. I mean, yeah, and and just the track in general. Like at yeah. Iona, we didn't have a track. We used Iona Prep. Neither you know, that, was, that was our track. Or we'd go down to the public track at Van Corla Park, and we would use that. Hopefully, there was no, you know, hopefully the local high school didn't get out for recess and kids start running around the track while we were there. <laughs> you know, so it's just that's just you know. That, that's the way it goes. So like, yeah, with, even within just our right, track sport, is different than cross country. Track is so much sense. different than cross country. And, and it's, it's um yeah, like cross country is just kind of the simplest of the simple, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's a great sport in that sense where, you know, it's similar to like some of the other sports like soccer and stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. you need a ball and you need your feet and, you know, in cross country, you need a pair of shoes, you need some legs and there you go. You can go do it. So yeah. I want to ask you, if you could sit there and right now, 2023, Coach Ricardo Santos can go back in time to 2008, bright-eyed, 
about to be brand new head coach at Iona. What's some advice that you would give him right now that, you know, maybe something that you didn't know jumping in, you know, like Coach Burns said, are you sure you want to do this? Like, what's something that you would give him advice and maybe this will resonate well to any other, you know, young coaches that are listening right now? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, um, realize that you don't have all the answers and you're never going to have all the answers and use the people around you to help you get to those answers your assistants, but mainly, you know, have those conversations with your athletes because every one of them is different and you need to tweak things for the individual. And you're only going to learn that you're only going to know what each individual ticks by talking to them and getting their feedback. And I know that sometimes, you know, um, some athletes are, are, you know, um, they're uh, a lot quieter than others or they don't want to give out too much information or like let's say if they're if they're not training's not going well they don't want to admit it they don't want to admit oh you know i'm not feeling well in training you know, they're kind of more like no everything's fine everything's fine so really kind of building those relationships with your athletes and you know and i i i did kind of know that but not to the degree that i understand it now yeah. you know as throughout the years you you kind of look at it more because when you're young you feel like you're kind of like in this in this um um you feel like you're just like oh i i know everything or i'm supposed to know everything so you also have your own insecurities of like well if i talk to that person about how they're feeling or about a workout and how they felt in the workout or what they thought of a workout you know that's going to make that's going to you know kind of touch on my insecurities so not being insecure about things, realizing that, hey, you don't have all the answers. This Our sport is always evolving and things training methods continue to change. All those things continue to change. Uh, and so getting feedback from your athletes and having those conversations uh, is going to help you really grow as, as a coach. That's an absolutely great advice. I Wonderful. love that. So we talk to a lot of our guests about how can we improve this sport? How can we make this sport more popular so that, you know, casuals will start to enjoy it so that we can get NCAA track and field? You know, it had pretty good numbers because we're on ESPN, right? But when are we going to get Kai Robinson really out there? The guy just doubled in a 10K, 5K. Like, people don't understand how difficult that is to double and win both in a really good field in, like you said, the best competition in the world at that age bracket right mm. as you've been around the sport for a long time what do you think we can do to improve it to make sure that we get these athletes recognized noticed and kind of get the sport moving because i think paid. now is now is as good as it's ever going to be yeah yeah i mean i think i think we've we've started to do some of that with the nil um i know a lot of people don't like the nil and and you know i'm still kind of I like the NIL for the sense of it's a good opportunity for our student athletes. I don't like the NIL because there's no real rules around it and yeah. everyone is using it in different fashions. And some people out there are using it in fashions that are, it's not supposed to be used in. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I do think the <laughs> NIL is good for them. It gets them out there, you know, um, in the sense of, of, you know, televised tell you know, you know watching it on online or or you know being televised can we please please these the you know i'm 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 just so i'm so tired of them cutting in the middle of a race yeah. thank you we have all time. we have the technology to go picture in picture <laughs> why we've had it for years go, why do we cut to a commercial and they, and espn did it all just in texas they all do it. You can't. I don't think you can find the full the full 10k online or the full 5k's online. Nope. Like, how can you not? Okay, put up the commercial in the in the main screen, but have the race going on in the bottom like that. They do it for other sports. Why not this one? Exactly. I don't understand. We've had this technology forever, you know. And, and even and when so, they cut to field events too, when they cut to field events, why right, exactly. cut the race picture. out completely? Yeah. You can, you can definitely put two pictures in there and, and have you can put four, you can put four or five if you want. Right. Exactly. Like you, you've, you know, we've seen it where, you know, you can have four screens going on in, in, in when you're streaming online, you can have four different things going on. So I think that's a big thing because I think people get frustrated with that. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, at the end of the day, um, it, it's one of those things where I, I just do feel like, you know, 
our sport has so much participation. There's so much, there's so many people that are in it, but, um, you know, it's hard to make a living out of it because, yes. you know, there's just, the companies just aren't putting that money behind the, uh, the athlete that as much, you know, so it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, they have all these different groups and they have all these training, but I, I do think that we can advertise much better with it. You know, we can, we can use athletes and have much, much better advertising yeah. just on like regular commercials. Like when you see a Nike commercial, do you see Grant Fisher or do you see Cooper tier? You don't, do you see a thing Mo? No, you don't. Like you don't see them. I, mean, you see I saw it, Sydney McLaughlin. You see Sydney Peter Ray commercial, and that was like, and I was actually shocked to see Sydney yeah. McLaughlin even being mentioned. Like right. you should, yeah. but that's like, uh, yeah. Listen, I mean, I mean, I mean, we see. I mean, Bolt was was awesome with that, but like mm-hmm. since he's been gone, you know, like why is Noah Lyles not on more commercials? The guy's yeah, like, he's, exactly. he's electric. He's got a great personality. He, right. like, he should be all over the place. He's, yeah. you know. Uh, and and I and I think it's the, it's it's the companies using these athletes more and, and promoting them more. Like they have, if they like, and that's and and when they do that, it helps their brand. Of course, it really helps their brand. So yeah. I just think yeah, it comes down to the to the shoe companies just really sponsorship you know, marketing, just sponsoring and marketing their athletes uh, better. Um, yeah, you know, that's, or like you know, part. like this person runs for Nike, but this meet is run by Adidas. Like there, there's too much of that stuff too, that I feel kind of gets in the way. Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. There's that, there's that company versus that. company, you know, and it's like, right. Or, right. you know, and also there's a lot of athletes, like we said earlier that, you know, they don't run enough races. Like you mm-hmm. can't, they're like, they, they run once or twice every year. And listen, that that's their, their choice and that's fine. But we need these athletes to participate more and to be out there and to mm-hmm. say, this person's going to run at this meet on this day on this channel, lock it in, you know? Right, and exactly. Then- yeah. So do you think that part of it is because, you know, like Dave said, we don't know where the athletes are going to be. Do you think it's more uh, financially lucrative for a shoe company to, you know, know that Stanford is going to be here, here and here. Like, I don't know who sponsors you guys or has your jerseys. Uh, so who does? I don't want to stamp on anyone's toes. Are you so guys? We're, Ni- we're, Ni- we're Nike. You guys are Nike. So do you think it's more lucrative for Nike to sit there and put all their eggs into collegiate baskets, right? Because there's a ton of schools that wear Nike. They have Nike warmups. They have Nike sing- singlets. You know what I mean? So do you think that they're kind of still more focused on the fact that there's still a team aspect and Stanford gets the glory and there's that Nike logo right there at the beginning while, you know, people are crossing that tape where as opposed to the pro level, there's no teams. People don't know what the hell's going on. You have to be a, a junkie to know, you know, who's running where and what meet and let's go search for the Diamond League. And if you it's don't not have Peacock, Peacock, it's not Flow Track, it's, yeah. it's on YouTube. So do yeah. you, there's kind of just that incentive for these shoe companies to just kind of stick with the team aspect of what they know and make more money that way. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there is Um, now how much money they actually make off of college teams. I'm not quite sure that that's that much. I mean, it probably more of having merchandise sold and things like that. Like obviously you have all the alumni and the current student athletes that will buy Stanford gear. And majority of that is, is Nike and some is some other retail companies, but, um, but yeah, I mean, they probably do sell more of that stuff, the college um, um, merchandise than they do the pro uh, maybe outside of Bowerman. I'm sure that Bowerman is pretty, pretty popular with with Nike and and things like that. But yeah. And again, it, it goes back to, you know, having, maybe you know a lot of these a lot of these shoe companies have uh multiple teams in, in uh, professional teams or professional groups and maybe it's advertising or or marketing the, the the actual team along with those individuals that that can help that but um yeah i mean i think there's something to say there that because of the alumni base because of the population of the students at a school it's more lucrative for them to focus on on the collegiate aspect of it as opposed to the professional aspect because that's more of a niche crowd it's more of a of a of a population that's smaller yeah so what's next uh for you obviously your season has come to an end with nationals and everything you had your success um obviously kai it goes over and runs for Team Australia. Like he's very good with them. Um, Charlie for England. How much is your involvement once they go off and do some things like that? Are they calling you for advice? Like how much are you allowed to kind of still be coach, even though they're still your athletes technically? Like, uh, mm-hmm. 
feel like that dynamic is interesting as to what you're allowed to do when they're over competing internationally. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm allowed to coach them. I'm obviously um, not allowed to have like physical practice with them uh, by NCAA rules in the summer, uh, uh, unless they unless they request me to be there for safety reasons. Um, you know, maybe it's a hot day and they're like, coach, I'm going to work out. Can you bring me some water or something like that so I don't pass out on the track, you know, stuff like that. But, yep. uh, but no, I'm still involved in, in their, in their coaching through, through the summer. And, and um, you know, so like, yeah, like Kai Robinson right now, he's trying to make the Australian team for worlds. And we have a couple of races in Europe that, that he's gearing up for and, and we'll be going over there to do, to try to be selected for, for the team. Um, and hopefully that happens. And, and so I'm, I'm, you know, been coaching him and, and obviously Charles as well. He's going to be running the British trials soon. So, um, you know, been, been helping out with him too and getting, getting him ready for that, uh, for the time being. So, but yeah, and we have a few others like Cole Sprout still training and and getting ready for USA's in the in the 10K. Yeah. Um, he's running this weekend in Portland 5K to see if he can get the standard in the 5K as well, and then we'll kind of decide. But he already has the standard in the 10K for for USA, so he's still training and getting ready for that. Uh, but yeah, most others are uh, have been t- have taken their break and they're back building up and and getting back running and uh, and so they have their training plan for for the next month or so before I kind of update it heading into the rest of the summer. So, nice. so I have a question because we, we've uh, actually talked about this a few times on our show. So in the college level, um, it's all about racing and placing and winning the actual race at the pro level. It seems that there's been this huge shift to everything. Now is just a time trial. It doesn't really matter where you place. It's, it's about how fast you run. And that's, you know, that's what a lot of, sponsorships are, 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 are given on, you know, like if, if you run a certain time or that, do you feel like the art of racing is kind of gone away at, at the pro level where it's still there kind of college level? Like, cause in the pros, it doesn't seem to matter if you finish 10th, but if you run three thirty, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. when 10th place. And we see it sometimes, I think at the college level still, but not as prevalent, like Dave's saying. Yeah. I mean, you, you still see it at the college level just because the regular season is all about time trying time trialing at the college level. And, I, and then I think you sometimes you see, oh, how did this guy not make it to nationals? Or how do you get knocked out and not make his conference final if it's a, you know, one of those really big conferences? Um, and sometimes, yeah, I think I do think that the art of racing, um, you know, has kind of yeah, they don't know how to declined. race. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, they, they has declined over over the years, but I, I think it's starting to pick up a little bit more. You know, and you have savvy runners that that know and, and that have those tools to be able to kind of switch on and off like that from time trialing to racing. Others, you need to work a little bit more on, uh, kind of getting them mentally ready, kind of getting their bodies ready for you know more tactical race. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think, uh, especially when you look at the Diamond League meets, um, I don't know if the new point system. You know, with that, has that helped in kind of racing a little bit more because it does place a little bit more emphasis on your place and how you place in these higher meets where you can get some points out of it. But there's also a correlation to time as well. So it kind of uses both aspects to it when when you're looking at the point system for world athletics uh, rankings. Um but yeah, I, I do feel like in, in the professionals, you I mean you're really not you're pretty much time trialing majority of the time until you're getting to you know the championships, which there's less championships than in the colleges. So maybe it looks like you know colleges they do a little bit more racing or you know have a little bit more tactical races because really the last month of college racing is that, whereas at the professional level it's one meet a year basically. You know, yeah. because if you're if you're running at that level, you know, unless you're from a country that's really deep, like the U.S. and the distances right now, or you know, the U.S. and in, in most track and field events, and you know, Kenya and Ethiopia and in and the African countries and the distance events, like you're really not, you know, a lot of these time, a lot of these athletes that run at worlds, you know, I don't want to say have an easy path to their national team, but aren't as aren't going down to the well or, or having to do as much as some others in, in some other countries. Yeah. So yeah, that's certainly fair to say. So I got one more question for you. Cause I am a fan of it. Do you like the lights like on the track for the world record? Yeah. For the casual fan, you know, like, like, cause I think that is a, a great way kind of like the first down line in, in, in football. Like you could see, all right, like if I'm watching a race, I'm like, all right, so they just have to stay ahead of that light. I think that it's kind of a big addition 
for the casual fan to kind of see what what is going on. Some people hate it. Some people are like, oh, it's ridiculous. You know, it's cheating, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but yeah. I think if we're trying to, to build the sport, I kind of like it. Yeah. No, I like it. Um, the, um, you know, I was, at, I was at World Champs last year. Obviously, they didn't use it at World Champs, but um, – the first this weekend was actually, I believe, the first time I've seen it up close because I was at the uh, Nike Outdoor Nationals and they used it for, for the high school Nike um, Nationals uh, this past weekend. So, uh, and I, I liked it. I've 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 liked it when they use it in Diamond League. I think it keeps people engaged and they kind of can look at it and see. Uh, where sometimes if you have just a rabbit out there or a pacemaker, you don't really know if the pacemaker is on or not or if they're too quick or maybe the pacemaker's on and those and they're just not going with them and so the crowd's kind of like what's going on is he too fast is he too slow but with the lights they can kind of look at it and see oh you know they're just not going with the pacer this time and they're it's going to become a little bit more of a tactical race or oh shoot the pacer's going out way too quick let's see what happens here you know because they can tell by the lights and so i think it's a good thing i think anything that that um really can propel our sport forward is good like I, I get some of these coaches that have talked about or some of these former athletes that have talked about, you know, the super shoes and all that stuff. I'm for the super shoes. Everyone wears them anyway. It's different Everyone wears them, but it's not just that it's like, it's actually keeping our athletes healthier because, you know, I remember putting on flats oh. and my legs would be done. For done. Weeks. <laughs> They're burning. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like you'd finish, you'd run a 10K and you couldn't train for another week and a half where now they can actually train. So I think it, I think when people look at it and they look at these super shoes, I think they look at it the wrong way. They look at it as, oh, they're, you know, whatever they're, they're, um, you know, it, it's an enhancement. It's like shoe doping or whatever they call it. I look at it as like, <laughs> it's a tool to help our athletes stay healthier so they can actually train and they can actually have longevity in the sport. And shouldn't you know. we evolve as a sport? I mean, you know, exactly. Like you, you I mean, have a lot, you know, which is fine. It, it's their way, but a lot of, of of these purists, you know, who love us to still run in cinder tracks with, you know, the inch long spikes, you know, spikes. but like you yeah. have to, or, you have to e evolve. Yeah, you have to as evolve. A sport. I mean, remember they never had evolved too. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they didn't have blocks back in the days. They used to have to, you know, shovel out their little, you know, in, in their lane, they used to have to shovel out uh, in the, from the cinder yeah, track. Good. And, and, you know, so it's like it, the sport evolves, like every sport evolves. So right. let's evolve with the time. Let's 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 embrace this technology because it's actually helping our young athletes and our pros to stay healthier longer. So we can so they can have a career, the career that they may deserve and, you know, and, and have them have fun with the sport. I mean, people hated the Fosbury flop. Is there anybody who doesn't do it now? In, exactly. In high yeah. jump, you know. Like, yeah. I will yeah. say this: we had a uh, Jeff Benjamin on. I don't know if you know Jeff, a uh, writer, and um, he mentioned that there was some that people were overusing the super shoes, mm -hmm. so they were not feeling the negative effects at all, and they were eventually getting hurt. So are mm -hmm. you finding that you have to kind of temper your athletes, like no super shoes today? Like that was kind of. I think it's like. Old school, where it was like, okay, we're doing a speed workout, no spikes today. Like, I feel like the super shoes have now become the no spikes today type of rule. Like, no, no super shoes today. Like, do you do you find yourself doing that every once in a while? No, I, I don't because I think what I what I found with um, the guys at Stanford um, is that you know they'll kind of switch things up on their own, anyways. Smart. Um, and, and some of them don't like to be in the super shoes for the whole workout. So they may switch to some something over, or if we're doing something a little bit more intense at the end or quicker at the end, they'll switch over to spikes. Um, so, yeah, but to be honest, like whatever keeps them healthy, as long as they're not having any issues uh, or any injuries coming up from them, I'm okay with them to, to stay in it. I, I, you know, it's, it's a personal preference and I'm going to respect what, what they feel uh, their body needs. So. Yeah, out of all the sports, track is very much. You got to listen to yourself as well as the coach. You can't only rely on coach because coach does not know how you feel. So young athletes, keep that in mind. Listen to your body. But yeah. lastly, I just want to say, I feel with the lights, I feel like it's like the highlight of puck and hockey. I feel like it's going to go away at some point as much as I think it's cool. This is just us being track guys, knowing that we've been abused for so many years. Like we get one minor thing. Like they gave us lights. Let's be real happy. So no, it is kind of cool at times. I feel like if they, you know, they should turn them off if the world. I'm not sure time. about high school level. That's a little, you know, I'm there, yeah. but definitely like the, you know, like, Hey, when Inger Richardson ran his 754, I, I was watching him. I was watching the lights. I'm like, he's out of pace. They're going know. for a world record. And I thought it was cool. They're capable of it. 
Sure. Right. Like and then you don't need them U.S. nationals because again, hopefully that's going to be more of a tactical race. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. I mean, it meets it meets like championship meets. No, I'm not. You don't 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 put those out there. Don't Absolutely. So their championship meets. It's about racing and all that. But if it's Diamond so, League and they're going for it, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, and and even at Nike this past weekend, they didn't have the lights on and everything. They they had them more for the uh, like the, they had like a mile and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, they had it like for for the mile um, and a few other like kind of like high level races where they had like the professionals that on the Friday night, they had like some professional races in the eighth nice. and, and the 1500. Uh, and so they had, uh, they had the lights for that. And also like for the five K's for the high school, five mm-hmm. K's, and I think the high school yeah. two mile and, and uh, steeples, they had the yeah. lights out for that. I have a stance because like, can you imagine watching a football game now on TV without the yellow line for the first down? Oh yeah, I know. What, you what, know? I mean, that changed everything. Like go, you know, like, yeah. Maybe like the only here. tweak I would say is that if it's like a bunch of professional guys, you should give the goal time and it should be on screen like goal time light is on this time. So mm-hmm. if you have, you know, we talked to Clayton Murphy, we had him on the show not too long ago. If his goal is to run, you know, break it, you know, break, get a PR run low 142, right? They should put, you know, goal time, 142, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think that would be cool. Like, that would be yeah. more – and it would definitely embrace the casual because they would sit there and look and be like, okay, oh, they're on. He, he's yeah. might, you might right. get yeah, – I mean, right. maybe, maybe something like that. If yeah, you don't, I don't know, know what does lights mean, then it's, it's – yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I know the announcers try to say at the beginning, oh, the, yeah. the purple light is this and the and the, the – This is the pacer is light uh, and, and, and this is the – Yeah, the yeah. But it, it would be good to have it kind of up on the screen so then yeah. obviously some people may not be paying attention at that time or forget. And, and so the if it's – announcers – the announcers at these events could be a whole other podcast, but coach, uh, we thank you for coming on. We're not going to, we're not going to keep you all night. Thanks coach. We appreciate you coming on. This was a fun show. Yeah, no thank you so worries. much. I really appreciate you guys having me. All right. So once care. again, he's coach Ricardo Santos. He is the assistant distance coach over at Stanford university. Um, we predict he's going to have much more success. And when he does, we will be hearkening on him again to come back on the show. So, um, everyone go search your Stanford XCTF. Uh, go follow them on all of their handles. Keep in touch. See all their things. Watch them do some of their, you know, badass workouts because that's one of the things everyone does. They post up their stuff. So, and go follow their athletes. Uh, they have a lot of great athletes, a lot of great follows there. So definitely go show some love to Stanford cross country track and field, both men and women. So, Dave, anything you have to say before we jump out of here? This was, was an honor, you know, to, to have someone who was such an elite runner and then coached and just to get the different perspective of coaching at a smaller college, coaching pros, going to a huge major university, just to hear all that in, in its own context was pretty cool. Thanks, coach. No, thanks. Really appreciate and, you guys having me. And it was definitely nice talking to coach when I wasn't, you know, competing against him <laughs> in some way as an athlete or as a coach and just like watching and just hoping and praying that maybe something might fall our way. But you know, man, it was it was always a blast seeing you there, Coach. You were always awesome. So, All right. uh, so say say hi to Pete and Chuck for me next time you see them. I certainly will. So again, if we everyone, had Chuck on earlier, we did. Oh, nice, nice. So if you like what you heard, give us a like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five star, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Find us on the socials once again at Talking Nobles. We will be back next week. So long, everyone.